choir to lead us in or to share some music with us. <laughs> Yes, 
Wendy. Um, I was raised in the United Church primarily and mm-hmm. the Anglican 
church. And what I like about the Anglican service is the liturgy, like the whole thing. There's a drawing together, and there's, to me, a more participatory uh, component. And I like that every time I come to it, whether it's the creed or the Lord's Prayer, it's like I learn something new. And I really listen and try and understand. And, and so I like the, I like the service. I like well, uh, Shirley. Uh, I like the Eucharist with it. Uh, and I also like the peace. Oh, no. mm -hmm. I'm Denise. Uh, I do enjoy the sermons. They're within me. It, it gives me thought. But I also like the music. So. I'm Doreen, and I like everything. No, I like uh, food. But um, since I've been at St. George's uh, Communion, <laughs> by far, it's like way up there, which it should be, of course. But I remember after I had taken communion here a few times, I said to Rob Feed, I said, well, I said, I've never felt this way before, and I know I'm supposed to feel this, all these things that I'm feeling here, but I just, you know, you, you can't make it happen. And I said, every time I go up to the altar rail and receive communion here, it's real. And he said to me, well, what did you expect? <laughs> and, and, and then when I got over to St. Paul's where I'm now doing my work, I, I'm having it there too. So it's, it's really, really, it just takes me away and it's wonderful. Very grateful for that. Don't feel pressure to have to answer the question, but if you can introduce yourself. I'm here. Patricia and I'm Robin's daughter-in-law and I came along to basically support you. Mm -hmm. say. So what do you find inspiring about the Christian message? Well, I don't, I don't, I'm not a practice, I was brought up Catholic, but I don't belong to any church anymore. But um, I, I, I used to belong to Unity Church in Montreal, okay. which is non-denominational. Yeah, Unity is awesome. Uh, it was kind of considered new thought at the time. It's about sort of a metaphysical okay. interpretation of the Christian uh, but uh, what I like is, yeah, the music is always great. Uh, the, uh, the incredible ministry there. Uh, so that, that was inspiring. And always kind of like the, the, just the coming together of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, unity. Yeah. I, I, I'm impressed by the way that music has been inspired by the Bible story. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we get the Messiah over and over again, which tells a whole story about the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, coming of uh, the Messiah and uh, his, his arrival. And uh, of course, Mendelssohn wrote um, Elijah, one of my favorites, which is a story about uh, how uh, Elijah um, persuaded his god to overcome the pagan gods of the, of the enemy. And um, <coughs> interesting, both Handel and Mendelssohn were Germans, and yet they, at this time, the Germans were the best friends. And it's such a tragedy in the 20th century that it fell out mm -hmm. and became enemies for such a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm Martha, and uh, I love singing in worship. I also love watching as people come forward to receive the communion. I find that extremely moving. Um, hold on to your answers, because you might be surprised at how many of your answers uh, kind of got their start here at St. George's in this period that we're talking about, okay? So just uh, to frame the, uh, this period of time that we're talking about, here are some key dates for you to know. Um, 1870 to 72 is when Christ Church was formed, and that's uh, since being closed. I think it closed around 05 or 06. 
No, 0, 04. It might be in the round 04. Um, St. Barnabas began in 1875. Um, the, uh, the Diocese of Niagara also began in 1875. And that makes it the fourth <laughs> diocese that St. George's has been part of in its history. So it has been part of the Diocese of Nova Scotia first, then the Diocese of Quebec, then the Diocese of Toronto, then the Diocese of Niagara. So that tells you something about the spread of Anglicanism across this continent as those dioceses were formed. And St. George's was here to see it all. Um, 1877 saw the formation of St. Thomas just down the street. And also around that same time, 1834, so a little bit earlier, was St. John's Port de Luzi. And 1871 was St. James Maritime. Now, um, you, if you've read Bishop Walter's book, you'll know that this period in, uh, in St. George's history, the chapter covering this period is called Family Breakup. And uh, we are going to see some um, controversies and some disagreements over the course of this history. We also see some very important developments. And uh, Robin Gard has done some research recently uh, that gives another um, angle on what was taking place during this time. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Robin to share a little bit about uh, his research and learning. Well, I'm very honored to be here to talk to you and uh, I, I'm very flattered too. Um, just a quick word about myself. Uh, I was born in Britain and spent 40 years there before emigrating to Canada with my family and I've spent about 50 years here in Canada. I think it was the best decision of my life. I think it's one of the best countries in the world, particularly uh, by comparison with my old country and the other country to the south of us. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we're doing great as Canadians. So um, what happened was that I, um, my dear wife passed away and I bought myself a little house on Liscar Street, which is a little street on the other side of the canal, what we call Western Hill. And um, I found myself next to a strange looking modern church, uh, which was being used as a, um, by a small fundamentalist group, probably uh, called Ilium, um, the kind of group that says that Jesus is going to return any minute now. Um, I, I realized that the church was not built for them, so I did some inquiries, and I found to my astonishment that it had been an Anglican church. So I went to the library and started to research it, and I found um, the standard article about it called Christ Anglican Church, Our History. And in it, I read the following words. Um, in 1867, the congregation here in St. George's was split by dissension over the services and there was soon a movement for falling in the parish. The rector at that time was the Reverend Henry Holland, but it was his curate, the Reverend John Francis, who was blamed for the creeping ritualistic practices that were introduced into the services. At a vestry meeting held in May of that year, Mr. Holland was asked to dispense with the services of the curate. He refused to do so. The rector contended that the vestry had no right to rule on the conduct of the church. And uh, I won't go into the details about what these ritualistic practices were, but it seems that uh, John Francis, the curate, disappeared from the, um, uh, the history shortly after, so he must have been let go. And um, so I started to dig deeper, and um, I was very, very privileged to be allowed by Martha to have access to the archives of this church, deep in the basement, where I spent many happy hours going through the old records. 
and I found it quite fascinating. First of all, um, here's Henry Holland, who is accused of having this dissenter. He is dealing with what was called the vestry. I have no idea whether you have something similar here, but uh, basically a rector is in total charge of a church, both uh, literal, scriptural, everything, and chairs the meetings of the vestry. But the vestry has the responsibility of doing things like looking after the plumbing and uh, extensions and fundraising and so forth. Everything except the liturgy. So when the uh, congregation went up to the minister and said, the vestry wants you to get rid of the curate, he was quite right in saying, it's none of your business how I run the service. But he did a very imaginative thing shortly afterwards. He said, look, we've got to get this clear. I'm going to close the vestry meeting, and we're going to open it up again as a meeting of the congregation, and you can say what you like. So they did, and um, they expressed themselves what they didn't like. There, there was at that time a, a kind of horror of what they called popery, meaning that if certain rituals came in, it was trending towards um, moving over to the Catholic Church. But the whole point of the Church of England was that it had split from the Catholic Church under Henry VIII and was now an independent church with the ruling monarch of England as the head of the nominal, nominal head of the church. Um, I think that this is um, a very interesting tendency because over there, a much larger country has a presidential system. Um, personally, I think that our system where we have a uh, head of the country called the dear old queen who goes around uh, bowing to people and opening plates and so on, but has absolutely no power at all, is much better than putting the fate of a country into the hands of one human being. And um, I just I just like so we, uh, we still have the queen on our stamps, we're still uh, a, a part of, uh, of Britain in that sense. So, um, at this um, critical meeting, the oath um, was taken about who wants ritual in the services and who doesn't. And in spite of the fact that the pressure to have this sorted out came from the people who disliked uh, ritualism, the voting was one third in favor of more ritualism and two thirds against. So, amazingly, the Anglican Church did not break up. The ritual went to St. Barnabas, when I'm amazed I can go on the website of St. Barnabas and it said they still hold services with ritual and incense. And they have, you can choose, you can go to a service with incense or without. Um, meanwhile here, um, I'm not going to comment about what uh, the Reverend Martha has decided, it's nothing to do with me, but going back to uh, the question of Christ Church, which is the name of this little church over there, the fact that um, it was not a schism, it was not a dissension, is brought home by the fact that the set up this little church and who conducted the services? Henry Holland from St George's. Went over there, only too happy to see a new church set up. Uh, the bishop came down and gave his blessing. In other words, it was an expansion of Anglicanism and not a feud. Um, and one of the commentators says that uh, from one church it's suddenly become four, which is St. George's, St. Thomas, Christ Church, and uh, St. Barnabas. 
So uh, it, it was a very striking uh, period. I think that's just about all I have to say. The, um, the little church on the other side um, slowly faded away and the bishop came and formally disestablished it in 2004. Thank you. Thank you. Robin just um, achieved his master's this past uh, spring at Brock University, and a lot of it was based on the work that he did here. Oh, so so awesome. Awesome. <laughs> 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 I do have questions for Robin, because I think that um, it's a striking um, Re-perspective, that's not really a word, but uh, a striking shift of perspective. Like, I didn't grow up in St. Catharines, but ever since I moved here, what I've heard is, especially St. Thomas, St. Thomas was created out of a schism at St. George's, and and there was a fight, and that's, that's how it all, and that's why there's, an Anglican church of stones throw from here is because of a schism. And so this shift of perspective that Robin has offered us to see it not so much as as the result of a family breakup, but as the expansion of Anglicanism in St. Catharines, um, I think is a really interesting uh, way to reframe history for ourselves. So do you have any questions for Robin on his research? Just what, what what was sort of an example of popery as you call it uh, that would uh, cause the, the, the uh, disagreement amongst the, the people? An example of the what they call the creepy ritualistic practices. Yeah. 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 So what would be some? Uh, <laughs> I actually do want to come to that topic okay. Okay. a little bit That's later. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. yeah. That's a, kind of a central topic. For I'm impressed by the fact that they that they were able to say, well, this group is going to worship this way and this one this way, and they were all still Anglicans. They weren't splitting up and leaving the Anglican church over. I'm a little surprised, but that's up to the bishop, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a good thing that it was allowed to to that they were the people were allowed to worship in the way that was appealing. Well, it's them. a very Anglican solution, isn't it? I mean, it's so yeah. Anglican of us. Like, we're the middle way. We kind of hold in tension these Catholic uh, leanings and these these more low church or evangelical leanings. And so, so what's the solution? Just offer it all. You know? <laughs> offer it all and people can pick what works for them. Yeah, sure. another question. It was always my understanding, maybe John can clarify it, but I always thought that Christ Church sort of established St. Thomas. And that there was a relationship between Christ Church and St. Thomas. In fact, I think they used to at one time pray to Christ Church once a year or something like that. Was that not right now? Yeah, so the, it, it, the, the circle of St. George supported Christ Church, but Christ Church was the one that created St. Thomas. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? Yes, oh, uh, so Chuck was saying that um, his understanding was that St. Thomas was created as an expansion of Christ Church. That's a very interesting point. I, I, I couldn't understand that. I came across something exactly to that effect. I don't think it matters. I think it's a question of all these churches. There was, I, I came across in my research, somebody who said that in a certain year, at the end of the 19th century, there were 15 churches under construction in, in St. Catharines at the same time. A sudden explosion of, of, uh, of, of interest in worship. And uh, so the uh, I mean, it's all these very beautiful churches, there's one on Welland Avenue, uh, uh, the, was a Methodist, now something else. Uh, and Church, Church Street had so many churches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yes, uh, it, 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 it's, I, I couldn't tell you the difference in timing between Christchurch and St. Thomas, pretty simultaneous. There's yeah. a, there is a very old map of St. Catharines, and I thought it was a printing error. This street was called Academy, yeah. and it was renamed Church Street. Because the Academy was the, what is Robertson School, one next to the and it was this street was called Academy because that's part of the goal. It, it was on. It, it was very well on it. And uh, Academy Street, I think, had the word church street or something. I thought it was a printing error, but I was told that, that was actually the name of the street. Oh, okay. Maybe that, maybe it was I could have just said one more thing then on this street. If you uh, look at the statue of William Hamilton Merrick, just this side of our beautiful new bridge here. Uh, in the shadow of it is a stone marking the site of the first Anglican church here. It was a wooden structure and it was replaced by this beautiful building. Simultaneously, uh, St. Mark's in Newark, which is now Niagara the Lake, was under construction, and St. Andrew's in uh, Forty Mile, which is you know, uh, Grimsey, Grimsey, Grimsey. Yeah. That, that's my preferred that Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, trust me. Um, something else that uh, Robin pointed out in his paper that I thought was very interesting was uh, the influence of the Merritt family again um, at this critical juncture. That there is reason to suppose that that part of the motivation in building Christ Church over there, again, wasn't so much about, um, about schism as it was of the Merritt family kind of wanting a church that was closer to them and, and donating the land and the funds to do that. Um, so as much as the Merritt family was very influential in forming St. George's, um, then they were also very influential in, in that expansion that way. Yes, indeed. It's, it's, I want to go on forever, but in, um, when the very first governor of the new uh, province of uh, uh, Upper Canada was uh, Colonel Graves Simcoe, and he was a great man. Um, on one occasion, he walked all the way from here to Burlington um, because he needed to, get, to go there. Um, it's impossible to visualize what the, uh, the land was like. It was solid forest everywhere. It was occupied only by uh, native people. There's a few Indian trails. You can see the signs of the Indian trails going up. Uh, Street is one, uh, Pelham Road is one, and so on. And, um, Otherwise, it was dense forest, and when the settlers were offered a hundred acres each, um, they came flooding in, and of course they were not all anchors. There are many, many different uh, nations and religions forming the... Uh, but you're quite right to that, uh, the merits. What happened was that um, Thomas Merritt served under Simcoe in the Revolutionary War, fighting what became the Americans. And Thomas visited this area to see his old friend Simcoe, and Simcoe said, hey, why don't you come and settle here? This place has tremendous potential. This 12-mile creek uh, could make your fortune because we need mills, uh, the only form apart from human animal power was water power. You could build a mill, you could grind corn for us, you could make boards and so forth. So Thomas Merritt settled here and brought with him a three-year-old son named William Hamilton Merritt. Um, and he, of course, changed the whole geography. The only reason why that came out is what was called is to call the St. Catherine's Canal is because um, Merritt only 
thought it was necessary to build the canal as far as the Welland River. Uh, that was his objective, the Welland River, so he called it the Welland Canal. <laughs> and his name has stuck ever since. Now, Robin, if, uh, if anybody was interested in reading your paper, would you be willing for that to, to be shared? Not only really that, Martha, but I would be very happy to, um, if you'd like to take the names of anybody. Okay. It's uh, a fairly big document. I think it's readable. It is. It's very readable. It's very readable. So if people want to write down their names and emails after Certainly. we're done today, if you would like to have Robin's paper to read through, it's a really interesting read. And for me, um, it, it really reframed that part of our history. So, um, thank you so much, Robin. Yes, Chuck. I spoke to Robin the last time he was here, and I want to say it in public that uh, when he got his master's this year in 2017, I, I was an undergrad, and I got my... So I've got 11 years to go to <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to delve a little bit more into um, Henry Holland and uh, into Chuck's question about what exactly this creeping ritualism actually entailed um, and, uh, and how uh, formational this period of time actually was for us today. So Henry Holland um, came to St. George's, he was appointed the rector in 1864. The former curate, uh, the Reverend Thomas Robarts, had thought that he was going to be the next rector and was uh, very much disappointed. There's quite a series of correspondence between him and the bishop and him and the church wardens as he expresses his bitter disappointment had not been appointed the rector. But Henry Holland um, would turn out to be a very capable and influential leader here at St. George's. He served here until 1886 uh, for 22 years. He was the rector here at St. George's and he died shortly after he resigned. Um, like Dr. Atkinson, who went, uh, Reverend Atkinson before him, um, Henry Holland also suffered from bad health and, uh, and oftentimes had to rely on the, uh, the curates and the other associate priests to help out. Um, he had had a bout of malaria earlier in his life and continued to, to suffer from that. Henry Holland was ordained by the Archbishop of Canterbury and um, he served in Guyana, in Fort Erie, and then in St. Catharines. He had nine children, um, and, uh, and when he came to St. George's, um, he, uh, he did refer in his application letter to some controversy that was growing around the Anglican Church, uh, around the Tractarian movement. Um, but he did say in his letter that he wouldn't make any changes or adopt any of these uh, new rituals without um, the guidance and support of the congregation. That may or may not have turned out to be exactly true. Um, and after he did start here at St. George's, there was uh, some gossip that began to circulate up from Fort Erie, where he had been before, about some changes that he had made in Fort Erie that were a little less than popular. Things like changing the style of the pews, for goodness sakes, um, and things like that. So, uh, so he, he had some, some controversy that surrounded him um, coming into St. George's, and, and in his time at St. George's. When he arrived, St. George's was prosperous, it was debt free, and it was growing. And that growing part is very much related to what Robin has just shared with us, that the city was 
rapidly expanding. Anglicanism in St. Catharines was rapidly expanding. Um, there was a constant need for more space here at St. George's. Um, it was uh, into his time, kind of coming out of Dr. Atkinson and going into Henry Holland, that we saw the addition of the transepts in the church to make more room. Um, there are a couple of other important uh, additions to the church that take place under Henry Holland. Um, there is a Sunday school building that is erected during the time of Henry Holland to accommodate all of the children. Um, it's not the Bear's Den. So the Bear's Den is eventually the Sunday school building, um, but this was prior to the Bear's Den. Um, and, and under Henry Holland's leadership, as we see, uh, he helped to establish uh, Christ Church over on Western Hill, and he was extremely influential and uh, a main um, benefactor of establishing St. Barnabas. Uh, St. Barnabas was kind of established with, with two goals in mind. Uh, the one was to um, allow free reign for this creeping ritualism, um, and so that very different style of Anglican worship that still is offered at St. Barnabas today. But also, the big thing about St. Barnabas was that the pews were free at St. Barnabas. And so that addressed a need that you know we see coming up again and again at St. George's, which is, okay, like, what, what do we do with people who can't buy a pew? Um, what do we do about the fact that there are no more pews to buy? And, uh, and so St. George's for a while was offering more and more services and that some of the evening services, the pews would be free. Uh, but the building of St. Barnabas and Christ Church allowed for um, that much needed expansion to take place in some other ways. So a lot of growth and expansion takes place under the 22 years of leadership of Henry Holland. Now, the Tractarian movement, what exactly is it that we're talking about here when we talk about the Tractarian movement? And what are we talking about when we're talking about the popery and ritualism that starts to rear its head during this time? Okay, well, as, uh, as Robin indicated, um, a lot of that tension and controversy stems back to the roots of the Church of England as being um, the Reformation in England and, and a, a division between uh, the Church of England and Rome. Um, we like to uh, say as Anglicans that the Anglican Church was formed because King Henry VIII wanted a divorce. <laughs> Not exactly true. The, the Church of England came to be because there was a whole group of people who uh, wanted to bring the Reformation to England and saw King Henry VIII as their opportunity. And so they were able to bend the unhappy king's ears and, and get their way in England and to divide themselves very clearly from a lot of the ritual and practice and tradition of Rome and to reform the church. So in this period of time, in the mid-1800s, out of Oxford, Oxford University, there is this influential movement, the Tractarian movement, the Oxford movement, to reclaim a lot of that lost ritual in the Anglican tradition. Um, and so you start to see this division uh, between low Anglicanism and high Anglicanism, or evangelical Anglicanism and Anglo-Catholic Anglicanism. And it's around this time that you hear that language and you hear that division. Before that, it, it was much more uniform. Okay? So that's all happening at this time. Now, here are some examples 
of the things that people found so controversial in the 1860s and 1870s. Candles on the altar. <laughs> A cross on the altar. Priests wearing vestments. Light belt. Chasubles and stoles and and not just a cassock, but a surplus over top of that cassock. So, you know, vestments that we completely associate with Anglican worship today, that was considered novel and alarming in the 1860s and 1870s. The elevation of the host, so that, that moment during communion when the bread is lifted up, and we invite God's blessing on the bread. That was, oh my gosh, what is he doing up there? Like that was really upsetting to some people. The frequency of Holy Communion. So, so prior to this time, it was, um, you know, you might celebrate communion a couple of times a year. Uh, the Tractarian movement pushed to reclaim that weekly, if not more, weekly celebration of communion. The regular celebration of communion is kind of the central act of Christian worship. Um, you know how we changed the colors in the church for the different seasons. That all came out of the Tractarian movement. That did not happen before. There were colors and front frontals on the altar. There wasn't anything particular like frontals and candles and crosses to draw any attention to the altar at all because the altar played such a, a small role in Anglican worship prior to this time. Um, there, were, there were things like uh, just a, little things to make the dignity and solemnity of the service uh, more prominent. So asking people to be quiet before worship started. Asking people to be quiet during worship. Um, asking people to kneel at certain points. And, um, you know, things like having every, well, you, you see it on Sunday mornings when we say the creed. The choir and the, the clergy all turn toward the altar. That came out of this period of time. Um, I'm not sure that, that they went as far as to like cross themselves at points in the worship or to swing incense. I don't know that they were swinging incense here at St. George's during this time. Uh, but those would also be things that would be considered creeping ritualism and popery. Okay? Um, I found this interesting. In low Anglican services, the celebrant would actually stand on one side of the altar. So like kind of at the end of the altar, I guess. And in high mass, uh, the celebrant would stand in the center of the altar with their back to the congregation. And of course, that is still how worship is celebrated over at St. Barnabas. And that's how it was celebrated here until the 1870, 1970s. And that was another big controversy, was the, the priest coming around facing the congregation for communion. Um, before the Tractarian movement got its way, um, worship was very plain, the sermons were very long, there was very little music, um, and as Bishop Walter says in his book, which I think is a good summary, Worship lacked order, dignity, and ceremonial. Um, so think, think of all of the things that you named as the most important things, or the, the, your favorite things about worship. Maybe not the most important, just your favorite things. A lot of that came out of this period of time and would not have been part of worship before this period. As uh, Rob pointed out, uh, Mr. Francis, or the Reverend Francis, the curate at the time, seemed to be the most committed to these changes. Henry Holland didn't seem to be pushing that agenda as much. Um, but at the same time, uh, Henry Holland wouldn't fire Francis just because the, 
the vestry told him to, and in fact is quoted as saying that the vestry were not competent to act thereon <laughs> by telling him whether or not he should keep Mr. Francis on. So, how, how do you think you would react if I told you at our vestry that, uh, yeah, you're not competent to <laughs> weigh in on that, sorry. Try it in the next vestry. And you guys can all get the inside joke. <laughs> um, sorry. Well, I just want to much of what you were referring at that time and oh, that developed a kind of worship that we know and are familiar with. And what was it like back in England? I think that um, similarly, it, the worship in England would have been quite uniform prior to the Oxford Movement. And once the Oxford Movement started to gain traction, then you start to see that division. So there's the low Anglican churches, there's the high Anglican churches. And, and um, you can see in this area the influence of that, uh, that diversity, because Ridley College became the feeder school for Wycliffe College, which is the low Anglican branch of the Anglican Church. Uh, Trinity College School, Trinity School in Port Port Hope, Port Hope, Port Hope. Uh, was the feeder school then for Trinity College at U of T, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, high Anglican. So, so yeah, the, that's where you see a lot of the diversity of Anglicanism is during this time. Now, the architecture of St. George's reveals to us very clearly how much the Oxford movement actually won out. So it's very interesting that as Robin pointed out, when that vote was taken at that congregational meeting, only a third of the congregation was supportive of these changes. And yet we can see in our building that these changes um, won. And frankly, you can see, if you go down and worship at St. Thomas, you can see that these changes won down there too. Because a lot of the things that, that they were arguing about back then are totally present at St. Thomas as well. I mean, these have just become kind of standard Anglican expectations, right? Like, even in a low Anglican church, the priests are going to wear vestments and there's going to be candles on the altar. So, um, our architecture, uh, we the chancel um, was built in 1874. So that's the, the raised platform at the front of the church. So that reflects, again, the prominence of, um, of the altar and the prominence of receiving communion that you would that you would elevate all of that, and the prominence of the choir and the organ and music and the worship. So a lot of those, those ceremonial pieces are reflected by that raised chancel area that says, okay, we're, we're, we're putting the importance somewhere else now. Um, and then four years after that, in 1878, that's where the sanctu sanctuary was added on. So that's the next level up, the narrow piece at the very back of the of the chancel where the altar actually is, and, and the communion rail dividing the sanctuary from the chancel. And again, all of that reflects a more prominent place of the Eucharist. Now, it was also during this time that we see um, something very interesting happen with the stained glass at St. George's. Now you might remember from either last week, yeah, last week, that there was a good shepherd stained glass window that was um, offered as a memorial to the former rector, Dr. Atkinson. And Henry Holland, during this period, had that stained glass window removed, shipped over to Christ Church as a gift, a gift, which also, um, you know, bears up under Robin's point that that it wasn't so much a schism or a breakup, but but kind of a friendly expansion. Um, that there was this gift, 
as Walter kind of points out in his book, there might have been like an ulterior motive to that gift. Like Henry Holland might have gotten a little sick of hearing how much people love <laughs> Reverend Atkinson and was just as happy to have that stained glass removed and sent somewhere else. Um, but what is the stained glass that goes in in its place, in the most prominent place in St. George's, behind the altar in this newly built sanctuary? What is that stained glass? Road to Emmaus, which is kind of a formational Eucharistic text. And the Lord was revealed to them in the breaking of the bread. That's like, that's a heart and soul story about the prominence of the Eucharist, and that's the stained glass that goes in in this period. So, um, a really interesting time during the, during the history of St. George's. Now, I was going to read um, Henry Holland's daughter's brief biography of her father following his death, but I'm not going to do that because I want to have time to uh, talk a little bit and hear from you guys. Why do you think things like handles and vestments were such important questions and even controversial questions, the like questions that you would vote on 150 years ago, open up a separate meeting, a congregational meeting, to take a vote on whether these things should be allowed. Why do you think these things are so important? It's changed. Okay. I hate that word. <laughs> Christians hate that word. It doesn't matter what you're doing. People. People. Not just the Anglicans. Yeah. So we know it was way more comfortable with the, what, you know, what, yeah. Right. So, so that's kind of the bottom line as far as theory of imagination. It's just change must be bad. Change for people in anything is difficult, but it seems in religion is it's harder. harder. Yeah, yeah. It's a comfortable pew. Yeah, yeah. You see religion as a place of comfort. <clears throat> Interesting, okay, Chuck. I, I think they carried on a lot longer than that, too, because I, I can remember as a fairly young person, like, we would have morning prayer at the main service, and on certain period, certain times of the month, there was a break and then communion would fall. Yeah. And have the congregation would get up and walk out. I, yeah. Because I think my, my parents stayed for communion. I was asking people wonder why I couldn't go for the rest of them. <laughs> and, and the other thing is a, a good friend of mine who was a staunch member of this church, he remembers candles being lit here at St. George's in his lifetime, which would be in the nineteen fifties on, and people got up and walked out so that Maybe candles were there back in this fall's time, but somehow they disappeared. Yeah. In, in, into the 1900s, and candles were, were an exception. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Chuck, because like I grew up in the Anglican Church in the 1980s, and um, and the frequency of communion was a big question back then. Um, and and you see kind of another another wave of reform through the 70s and 80s uh, to, to reclaim a few more traditions and to, again, um, boost up the prominence of the Eucharist because, yeah, when I first started attending the Anglican Church as, you know, a seven-year-old, we would have communion once a month. And, and then in the 90s, it was morning prayer once a month and communion the rest of the time. Yeah. And so you had the people, my dad, who wouldn't go when it was morning prayer, and you had the people who wouldn't go when it was communion. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, my mom would go all the time, but, the, but you get the point, right? Yeah, so, um, so like a hundred years later, you're right, these questions were still being sort of regularly um, discussed and and argued over. And the vestments, because I remember, you know, Tiff, 
Paul Brewster said. I can't remember anything other than just the black and white. Oh, really? And now he heard it. Some of the best ones are works of art. Yeah, they are. They are. Okay. In those days back then, it was a, a bigger issue of whether you were Catholic or not Catholic. Right. And they would, I can see this popery business of saying, it's too Catholic. We're not Catholics. Yeah. You know? And uh, all the years I was in the United Church, we were either no robe at all, or a black robe, you know, an academic mm -hmm. robe. And now they're in, they're wearing the same vestments that you're wearing. Now they're doing the, the yearly colors, you know, and all of those things are coming in. Oh, and, nice. and churches that are, unless they're completely against any ritual at all, they people tend to like a little ritual and it's it's sneaking in. And uh, they're all going to be just like Anglicans. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my feeling because having grown up as a Catholic, mm -hmm. though all those things you're talking about were completely normal for the Catholic. They would be Catholic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. you know, hearing about the Anglicans having like, ooh, yeah. yeah. For me, I've always interpreted it as being, oh, they just want to be really clear that they're not Catholic. <laughs> well, and that's <laughs> exactly what <laughs> there, there was a really hard and fast rift between Protestants and Anglicans in this country and lots of other countries. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, there was. People were burnt at the stake. Well, yeah, <laughs> not in this country, but yeah. <laughs> they were burnt at the stake here. But that lingering distrust that right. and yes. and um, like I think that that was a very accepted. Um, very dis accepted discrimination on both sides. I think it was very acceptable right. to discriminate based on whether you were Catholic or Protestant mm -hmm. and which side of the, the fence you found yourself on. But even today, I'm okay with, I, I like everything that we do is Catholic, really, the same things as the Catholics do. And I went to a Mass, you know, and, and I was in Idaho a couple of weeks ago, and the two things that I don't like are the two things that we don't do, is, and that is ringing the bells, ooh, you know, What's that? And, and, and kissing the table. I don't like it when they kiss the table. <laughs> and you don't kiss the table. Well, but if I started, would you open a congregational meeting today? <laughs> 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 I would start kissing the table over at my place. <laughs> and then, but you know, it's just like you're being competent. That's where I say that. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said we would be told we would be competent. I would right. tell you all. Yes, yeah, we were competent. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's yes. right. Yes. You can't tell me. No, of course not. So, is, is it in any Anglican education that you kiss the table, or is it just not? Well, again, it's a high Anglican process. Yeah. Yeah. So, they would do it at St. Paul's. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Almost yeah. 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 So we had to be married at 11 o'clock. Well, you married, you could not have a communion service in the afternoon. Well, is that because you wanted to eat before? Yeah, that was, was partly related to eating. I remember you were, you were supposed to fast yes. leading up to the studio. Yes. I remember, I remember being a child before we went to church. Yeah, before we were going to fast. Oh, yeah. And you could not have communion twice on the same day. Yeah, no, I think that's a fairly, I think those, well, I don't know about the fasting, but not receiving communion more than once, that's kind of a low way. I am you can keep receiving communion. I was up north, I lived in Cochrane, and on Sunday went to church, had communion, and then a friend of mine was being, um, what is it called when you become the rector? It's uh, installed. Uh, no, that's not. Inductive. 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 Yeah. Yeah. In the afternoon at the church in a different town. And so we went to that, and I remember asking the bishop, can we have communion again? And he says, as long as it's not with the same people. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so painful. 
because you're with different people. It seems like kind of a superstition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're, um, we're drawing close to the end of our time. I just want to, uh, I want to encourage you to keep this period of time in mind. Um, when we face our own controversies and questions, you know, in <coughs> modern church land, because I think that uh, the perspective of history here does help us to kind of reframe the things that, that we get worked up about nowadays. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it's important for us to understand about the people in this time um, how, how emotional change can be, and as Denise pointed out, how emotional change can be, particularly when you're talking about church, when you're talking about religion, when you're talking about your relationship with God. Um, I think that that sympathy and that compassion is important for us all to, uh, to keep in mind, um, but it's also really important for us to, to realize that a lot of a lot of the things that we can feel very emotional about end up um, end up in the the wider perspective of time. Um, maybe not not being the end of the world. So yeah. I already think of you know, I think back of you know the congregations fighting over those various issues that uh, in our lifetime and I was I was a late up at the time. There was not, not no bloody or battlefield in your nation. Well, right? Yeah. And, 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 the, and the second one was the, the permission of children to receive the Yeah. It was, yeah. It was Huge. nasty and tough and a lot of struggle. Yeah. And, uh, and that was in our lifetime. So. Yeah, and a few more uh, fairly big controversies that we can. Um, Blessings and marriages. Blessings and marriages and uh, the remarriage of divorced persons. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, uh, it is interesting to note, just as one final note on our evening tonight, um, how many other changes were taking place as all of these uh, arguments were happening in the church as people were sorting out these changes in the church. And I think that also sheds some perspective on, um, on when change can feel particularly emotional is when we feel like the world around us is changing very fast. And so how is the world changing very fast around them right now? Um, well, we have Charles Darwin talking about the origin of species and uh, putting forward a completely new way of thinking about creation and, and how the world came into existence. Um, we have Anglicans, as they're fussing about candles and crosses, also wrestling very deeply with questions of what, it, what you actually do have to believe as an Anglican. And you know, can you accept some of these scientific ideas as an Anglican? How does that change, you know, saying the creed and, and what you believe and so on? And it was out of that controversy that the Canadian church actually initiated what became the first Lambeth Conference, uh, which is the gathering of all of the bishops across the whole Anglican Communion at Lambeth Palace in, um, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And that has happened about every 10 years ever since 1867, and that was a Canadian idea. But that, that came out of these wrestlings around belief. Um, 1867 is also when the Dominion of Canada came into existence 150 years ago. Meanwhile, we see through this very same time the invention of the phone, um, the city growing at a lightning pace, uh, it was incorporated as a city in 1876. Um, we see electricity, we see streetcars, we see eventually the automobile. Um, all of these really significant changes were taking place and that also helps us to understand um, why people had uh, a lot of anxiety about little changes. So thank you so much to Robin.
And uh, we don't meet next week, okay? Everybody has to remember that. And if you see anybody who's not here tonight, make sure that they know no meeting next week is Halloween. Go out trick or treating, hand out candy, scare people. Don't come here next week. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.